Hello everyone, my name is Haley Elizabeth and welcome to the very first episode of my podcast Behind You. If you're not familiar with this podcast, this is a true crime podcast where I talk about true crime stories. Uh, You can find the audio version every Tuesday where you can find podcasts and the visual version every Wednesday on my YouTube channel Haley Elizabeth. So yes, welcome to the very first episode, and if you're listening, thank you. I'm happy to have you. Um, today, we are going to be talking about the case of Stacy Castor. Now, there is quite a bit to get through, so we're just going to hop right into it. So Stacy Ruth Daniels was born on July 24th, 1967 in Weedsport, New York. She was raised by her mother, Judith, her father, Jerry, and her little brother, Brother Jamie. As far as the family growing up, they were comfortable financially. Her father Jerry sold cars for a living and her mother Judith was a stay-at-home mom and she was very, very close with her mother and so the family was, you know, they were not poor but they also weren't rich either. Stacy was described growing up as very headstrong. She always stood up for herself in every situation. She was always curious about everything as well. There was actually this rule in her house that her parents only allowed her to say why at most three times a day and that's because she was asking why to everything she was always constantly questioning authority and different things and just like she was always questioning everything basically and then in 1985 when she was a senior in high school at 18 years old that is when Stacy met 24 year old Michael Wallace As far as Michael's backstory, Michael was born on September 16th, 1961 in Auburn, New York. He actually was married um, previously to Stacy's third cousin, Nancy. Now, at the time of them meeting, they didn't know that Nancy was Stacy's third cousin just because Stacy and Nancy just never really talked to each other. So Nancy and Michael got married pretty young in high school. That's where they met. But later down the road in high school, Nancy actually got pregnant with another man's baby and the father of the baby didn't want to be in the baby's life. So Michael decided to step in and help Nancy take care of this child despite it not being his. And so that is when they both had this daughter named Renee. As time went on, the couple flourished and they both raised Renee together and down the road, that's when they had a son of their own named James. Now, over the course of the marriage, that is when Michael started to fall pretty heavily into drugs and alcohol. He was constantly in and out of jail for DUIs, and he was dabbling in drugs, and Nancy said that when he would get drunk or when he was on drugs, he would become very physically and verbally abusive, and this actually led to their divorce in 1984. So then the following year in 1985, that is when Michael and Stacy met for the very first time. Now, when they did meet, it was very odd because of the large age gap. Stacy was only 18 years old and Michael was 24. So with this six year age gap, a lot of people just kind of felt uncomfortable about it, but the couple didn't care and they ended up dating for a whole two years until 1987. That is when, unfortunately, Stacy and her mother Judith were on their way to the store and Stacy and her mother got into a pretty bad car accident where both of them had to be hospitalized and while Stacy was hospitalized that's when she found out she was pregnant with Michael's baby. Now Michael finding out that Stacy was pregnant he didn't want to raise a child with Stacy. He felt like he wasn't ready to be a father yet but Stacy really wanted to keep the child so since Stacy wanted to keep the child and Michael didn't want to raise it the couple had split up. So then in early of 1980 Eight, that is when Stacy had given birth to her daughter Ashley. Now she was in fact a single mother for the first couple of months but then after that her and Michael rekindled their relationship and Michael then became the father of Ashley. 
Now, as far as Stacy's family, you know, with Ashley and Michael and Nancy's family, his two kids with uh, Nancy, Renee, and James, there was surprisingly no bad blood between the families. The families would frequently spend holidays together so Michael could spend time with his, you know, Stacy side of the family, but also his ex-wife's kids as well. And they really didn't mind this dynamic. They all kind of loved each other. And of course, with Stacy and Nancy being cousins and their being family, it just made more sense for them to spend the, like just to spend holidays together. So then following in that same exact year of 1988, that is when Michael and Stacy had their second daughter named Brie. Now, it was very obvious that Michael favorited Brie over Ashley. A lot of people assume because this time around when they were having this child, he was ready to be a father. Um, he was also starting to sober up a little bit from his drugs and alcohol. Nancy said that from her perspective of the relationship, Stacy was definitely the more dominant one, but she could definitely see that Michael was a lot happier than he was before. So when they had their second child, Bree, the parents, of course, now having two children need to have a lot more money. So because of this, the parents worked a lot during the day. Uh, Stacy would work as an ambulance dispatcher and at night, Michael would go and be a mechanic. And so because of their busy schedules, they weren't able to see each other as often. So then this led into the end of 1999, over 10 years of marriage. Stacy had told a family friend that she was actually planning on divorcing Michael into the early year of 2000. And she said that she wanted to divorce him now, but with the holidays, she just didn't want to spoil anything. So she was going to wait until the new year to do it. But that eventually wouldn't come because in January of 2000, Michael grew very, very sick. He felt like he was very dizzy all the time. He said that he felt drunk even though he wasn't drunk. He was constantly throwing up and sweating. And he actually went to the doctor when he got like his early on symptoms. And the doctor said that it was just an ear infection. But as the illness got worse, he realized this was not just an ear infection. And Michael would actually asked Stacy if he could be taken to the hospital but Stacy always told him oh you know you're just going through a bad flu it's fine you're gonna get over it soon and then on January 11th of 2000 12 year old Ashley had came home from school because as part of her after school routine she would come home from school drop off her backpack and then she would leave to go pick up Brie from elementary school so while she was doing her normal routine she said that she saw her father Michael sitting on the couch with his mouth and his eyes open and he was making funny faces and so she just didn't really know or understand what was going on so she just kind of saw him and then just left to go pick up Brie from elementary school she just assumed that maybe he was playing a joke or something until as Ashley left to go to pick up Brie uh, Stacy had came home from work and that is when she found Michael on the couch unresponsive. So she called the police and when Bree and Ashley got back, the police directed the two girls to stay at a neighbor's house until Stacy's mother got there. And then at 39 years old, that is when Michael was pronounced dead at the hospital. Since uh, Michael had a history with drugs and alcohol, they just deemed it as a heart attack for some reason. They just assumed that it was no underlying medical condition and the police even asked Stacy if she wanted to perform an autopsy and she constantly refused it even though Michael's family told Stacy, hey, maybe an autopsy won't be that bad of an idea because what if he passed away of a medical condition that we're not aware of and Stacy just refused it. She was like, no, I'm not going to do an autopsy. I just want to get the funeral done and over with and just move on. So because of Michael's death, they actually received a $50,000 life insurance policy. And with this $50,000, they were able to pay for the funeral, pay for a couple bills, and Stacy took the two girls to Disney World. So because of this uh, trip to Disney World, they were kind of able to move on quite quickly from this death. And then from the year 2001 going into 2002, that is when Stacey 
Stacy had met David Castor. So a little bit of backstory on David Castor. David was born on June 12th, 1957 in Syracuse, New York. He was the third born of six children and he actually married um, and he was actually married at 19 years old to a woman named Janice. Now Janice's father owned a large company called Liverpool Heating that David actually worked for. And then in 1978, when David was 21 years old, that is when Janice's father actually made David the co-owner of Liverpool Heating. So Janice worked in the offices while David worked in, you know, a little bit of everything as well as Janice's father. And this is basically how Janice and David were able to pay their bills getting married so young. So then in 1978, after two years of marriage, that is when they would have their very first child together, a son named David Jr. Now, as far as the couple's marriage, Janice said that it was just like a typical marriage, you know, no marriage is perfect, but they would have their ups and downs, but you know, it was nothing to get divorced over or anything. It was just typical marital troubles. In 1987, the couple had been married at for 11 years at this point point. David's family was very outdoorsy. They were the type of family to go camping. They had lots of snowmobiles and dirt bikes and typically whenever David would go on his dirt bike, Janice would go with him but ride on the back of his dirt bike. So one day David surprised Janice with a dirt bike of her own so she wouldn't have to always ride on the back of his but when Janice rode on this dirt bike, she just felt super uncomfortable on it. She didn't really know how to ride it. She she just felt like it was more fun if she rode with David. So because of this, David was like, okay, if you're not going to drive it, then I'll just sell it. So he gets on Janice's dirt bike to take it out for a test drive just to make sure that there's nothing wrong with it before he sells it. And so whilst he's going out in the fields and taking it out for a test drive, Janice and David Jr. are standing on their porch watching David, you know, take it for a test drive. And all of a sudden in the field, they see David crash and and car parts are flying everywhere. So immediately when that happens, Janice and David Jr. run out to the middle of the field to see what happened, and David is lying unconscious on the floor with blood coming out of his mouth. So David was quickly rushed to the hospital and because of this, the accident was really, really bad, but it wasn't the worst it could be, thank goodness, because David was actually wearing a helmet during this. So he did suffer a lot of consequences from this, such as when he woke up, he had actually lost all of his memory. He woke up in a panic and didn't know who he was or where he was at and he had to stay in the hospital for a couple of weeks to actually regain all of his memory. He even had to reteach himself how to do basic things. But thankfully, David was actually able to recover quite, uh, quite quickly and he was able to be sent home just a few weeks later. But when he was sent home, Nancy said that ever since he was sent home, he just was not the same. You could totally tell that he has lost all impulse control. He was a lot more verbally abusive to Nancy and David Jr. and the verbally and the verbal abuse got so bad at home to the point where David Jr. had to move out of the house at 16 years old. So around this time, David Jr. had actually graduated high school and moved on to go to the army. And around this time, this is actually when Janice's father had retired from Liverpool Heating and he had given the entire company away to David. So because of this, you know, huge promotion, they were actually living in a trailer at the time. And so David was able to get them out of their trailer and move them into a nice suburban home. And then in January of 2000, that is when Janice just felt like she deserved so much more. The verbal abuse at home got so much worse. So that is when she decided to leave David. Despite David begging her not to go, she just felt like this was the best thing for her to do. So she left David in January of 2000 and she went to go move into a women's shelter. And she lived in the women's shelter for a couple of months until she got a job of her own and was able to get her 
own apartment. During this breakup, uh, David was not handling the divorce well whatsoever. He fell heavily into alcohol specifically. He was in and out of jail for his DUIs. He was drinking a lot. He was drinking a lot. He would always show up to work drunk and it actually got so bad to the point where, um, as I said, he was the sole owner of Liverpool Heating and since he was showing up drunk every day to work, he was getting no work done and it got to the point where Janice's father actually had to come back to the business and basically save it because David was just not paying any attention to anything and so then after this um, David kind of realized that he had a drinking problem and so he went out there and tried to look for a little bit of help. On August 31st of 2001 that is when the divorce was final and he decided to go back out there and try to look for someone else basically just try to find some more companionship and then between 2001 to 2002 David actually had two girlfriends and with each girlfriend it would be the same routine basically what he would do is that he would find a girl and then he would hire that girl on for Liverpool heating as office manager and once she was office manager for a while he would propose to her but for the last two girlfriends he had and he did this to both of them said no to his proposal and when he and when they said no he just fired them and moved on to the next girl and the third girl he hired on was Stacy Castor. Now Stacy saw a lot in David. She felt like he was very wealthy. He had his own business. He owned snowmobiles and dirt bikes. He was very outdoorsy and she felt like he was the type of man that could support her Ashley and Brie so when David asked her to marry him Stacy said yes so then on August 16th of 2003 that is when the couple got married and then shortly after they got married that is when Stacy Ashley who was 15 at the time and Brie who was 12 years old at the time uh, to move into David's house so basically the tension between Ashley, Brie, and uh, David was very apparent. They also, uh, they always got into a lot of arguments when it came to the girls and David. They would get into arguments about a little bit of everything and because of David's lack of impulse control, it just made these arguments 10 times worse. So then in early August of 2005, that is when David asked Stacy if she wanted to go on a last minute wedding vacation. But since this vacation was a little bit too last minute, she had no one to watch Brie and the only person to watch Brie would be Ashley. But unfortunately, Ashley had to work during the time that they were going to go. And since it was so last minute, Ashley just couldn't ask her work for multiple days off. But Stacy was very understanding of this. She was like, yeah, that's fine. But when she told David, David was not so happy about this at all. David felt very offended. And this actually led to a seven hour argument between David, Stacy, Ashley, and Brie, all four of them just going back and forth. And it ended up with David locking himself in uh, him and Stacy's bedroom. And Stacy ended up having to sleep on the couch. Now, this is Stacy's story. Stacy said that while while she was sleeping on the couch, she woke up in the middle of the night and decided to go to the garage to have a cigarette. But when she went to the garage, uh, David had met her there, kind of like walked in there with her and just basically continued the argument that they were having earlier. And she kept on saying or insinuating that there was alcohol in his cup. And as I said, David had a lot of alcohol, um, had a lot of problems with alcohol abuse so she was very concerned and she kept on asking David if she could have a sip of whatever was in his cup and he kept on repeating the words leave me alone go get your own and just being very rude to Stacy and then she said afterwards when they both went inside David chugged a whole bottle of southern comfort and went up into the room and locked himself in there so then on Saturday August 20th of 2005 that is 
is when David passes out on his and Stacy's bedroom floor. And since she's trying to basically lift up David herself and put him on the bed, she can't do that all by herself. So she actually calls one of David's friends to help her. And David's friend had known David for such a long time. And he said that David, when he went there to help Stacy, like basically pick him up and put him on the bed, David looked super out of it and he said that he didn't even recognize David, although they had been best friends for years and years. Uh, Stacy kept on saying that the reason why he was super sick is because he got alcohol poisoning and he continues to drink all this alcohol, but the friend said that when he smelt David, he didn't even smell like alcohol. So then the next morning on Sunday, Stacy said that she actually saw David throwing up at 5 a.m. over the toilet and when she went in there to ask him if he was okay, he replied with the words, leave me alone and take the kids and leave because it's my house. So apparently he was just, you know, being very verbally abusive to Stacy and she didn't really want to deal with it. So she just kind of left the house all day and left David to himself. Now the next morning on Monday, uh, Monday morning, that is when Stacy calls the police and she tells the police to do a wellness check on David. And she basically tells the dispatcher over the phone the whole garage situation. She goes into detail about how uh, he chugged a whole bottle of Southern Comfort and he's been throwing up for the past two days and that she could have sworn she saw something in his cup and she also told the dispatcher that um, David kept on saying to Stacy that if Stacy leaves him she will regret it and she was very you know specific with that she was like yeah he always used to threaten me that if I left then I would regret it in some way so Stacy tells the police that she's starting to grow worried because it's Monday morning and usually David is always at work work but this morning he did not show up to work and she called the home multiple times and David did not pick up so she's very concerned for him so the dispatcher basically told Stacy to go back home and meet a sergeant there and a sergeant is going to try to get into the room and do a wellness check on David. Now the sergeant actually went to Stacy's house and Stacy met him there but the sergeant said that when Stacy was at the house she was just just like sitting in the front yard on a lawn chair smoking a cigarette and this was pretty odd because he just thought that it was really odd that if you feel like your you know husband is dead inside the house possibly or something is really really wrong with him you wouldn't just be so nonchalant and like smoking a cigarette as if nothing was going on a lot of people thought that maybe this was maybe a stress relief or something and then that is when the sergeant went into Stacy in David's room and he found David lying naked on the bed with bloody vomit next to his head and he had no pulse. So later after that, David was sent to the hospital and Stacy followed them. But while David and Stacy were at the hospital, the police decided to kind of investigate the scene and see what was really going on. And from the crime scene, they found a nightstand that had two cups. One was half full with green liquid and the other was empty but had a brown residue at the bottom. There was also cranberry juice and a bottle of apricot brandy. So so they kind of just assumed that, you know, since David had some history with alcohol, that this was probably just something related to that. But once in further investigating, they found out that the green liquid in the cup was actually antifreeze, as if he was drinking antifreeze. And at first, you know, with the antifreeze, they were just going to deem this entire thing as a suicide. But there was actually a detective on the case named Dominic Spadelli. And Dominic Dominic just had a really weird feeling about this. He was like, guys, we shouldn't just put this off as a suicide. Like, there is something more going on here. So he starts to investigate the crime scene further, and he finds a loaded shotgun underneath the bed. And so this was very odd to Dominic because he thought that if David really was trying to kill himself, then wouldn't it make more sense if he were to just take the shotgun and shoot himself instead of, you know, going through that 
horrendous death of drinking antifreeze because antifreeze is extremely brutal, especially dying from it. Um, one cup of antifreeze can actually make all of your organs shut down slowly and you suffer constant pain and throwing up 72 hours after intake. So this whole thing it was very odd to Dominic saying that like, okay, that makes no sense because if his true goal was to kill himself, why didn't he just use a shotgun instead of, you know, going through all of that constant pain for 72 hours? They also found a turkey baster in the kitchen trash can that was completely clean or it looked to be clean and for some reason Dominic felt like this was a clue. So they decided to take the turkey baster along with a few other items like such as the two cups and a couple of other things as well to back to the police station so they could do testing on it and hopefully get a little bit more upon the situation. So at the hospital, David was unfortunately pronounced dead and shortly after that, Ashley, Bree, and Stacy was taken down to the police station to just ask a couple of questions. Now, Stacy actually gave an eight-page long document of a statement and the police officer who was taking down Stacy statement said that this was one of the longest statements he's ever had to write down and it was just eight pages filled with every little detail that happened that day from what she ate what time she went into work what was going on what she was wearing what David was wearing and as far as Ashley and Bree's statement they were kind of you know normal they didn't really have much to say and everything that they were saying it didn't contradict what Stacy had written down but it also didn't help what Stacy had written down. It was just kind of, you know, they didn't know much because they weren't really at home. Stacy actually said during her interrogation that um, David probably got the idea, the antifreeze idea, because a couple months back they were watching an episode of 48 Hours where this woman had killed her husband by poisoning him with antifreeze. Now, 48 Hours, the show, actually came out about this and said that they had never released an episode where a wife had poisoned her husband with antifreeze. Now, at the time, they didn't know about this, but I just thought that was such a bizarre detail. But further into her statement, she says that David was known for being very depressed. He was very suicidal. He would say things like, if you ever left me, then you would regret it, things like that. Um, and so she was just kind of numb to the entire thing. And she said that she really grew concerned on Monday morning when she called multiple times to the household and there was absolutely no answer. So she felt like there was no other choice for her to make besides to call the police. So Stacy, Ashley, and Bree were good to go and they were sent home and so the police were kind of left with all of this evidence at the station and so whilst they were examining all of this evidence, they found that the two glasses on the nightstand were a little bit too clean for someone who had been sweating and vomiting for the past couple of days and they also found none of David's fingerprints anywhere on the cups. They only found three fingerprints and all three were from Stacy. Now, this was very odd because if, you know, David was drinking all of this liquid and was drinking this antifreeze, it would make sense for his fingerprints to be all over it, especially if he was sweating and vomiting, even his DNA on the cup. But for some reason, his DNA was nowhere on the cups, but his DNA was on one thing, and that was the tip of the turkey baster. So, so on the tip of the turkey baster, David's DNA was found and inside of the turkey baster, there was particles of antifreeze. So it kind of painted the picture for the police as if someone, possibly David, but they don't understand why David would do this, to basically take the cup that had antifreeze in it. Um, pump the turkey baster with antifreeze, thus getting no fingerprints on the cup, and putting the antifreeze into his mouth. But again, why would he go through all of this trouble when there was just a loaded shotgun underneath the bed the whole time? And why was Stacy's fingerprints on the cup? And why didn't she stop him or even mention any of this in her eight-page statement? They also looked into Stacy's home phone and business phone records and found that when Stacy 
Stacy was saying that she called multiple times Monday morning to see if David was okay. She only called one time Monday morning and then two hours later that's when she called the police. So the police already has caught her in a lie and then it even grew more suspicious when David's will came out and all of David's will basically left nothing to Janice or his son David Jr. but everything including his business, all of his life insurance policies, all of his like dirt bikes, snowmobiles, all of it went to Stacy, Ashley, and Bree, which was also very odd because he didn't even like Ashley and Bree. He saw Ashley and Bree as a burden. So why would he give all of his precious items to Ashley and Bree if he didn't even like them in the first place? But Stacy ended up getting the money from selling Liverpool Heating as well as a $50,000 life insurance policy. Now, of course, when Janice had found out about the news that David had passed away and the extra news that he left everything to Stacy, Ashley, and Bree, Janice stepped in and she said that this was very suspicious because David absolutely loved David Jr. And there is no way that he wouldn't leave at least something to his only son. And it would make more sense for David as a person to leave all of his dirt bikes and snowmobiles to David Jr. because the girls just weren't really interested in like snowmobiling and stuff like that. So that is when Janice had went through all of her documents and tried to find their marriage certificate and compare the signature, David's signature on the marriage certificate to that signature of the this like brand new will. So she brings the marriage certificate into the police station and they find that David's signature on the certificate is a lot different than his signature on the will. And they also noticed that on this new will, all of the witnesses to this new will was all of Stacy's friends. So it's starting to look very suspicious on Stacy. So the police start doing a little bit more digging on Stacy and they find that her ex-husband, Michael Wallace, actually suffered a very similar death to David. And they also found out that Michael was buried right next to David, like their plots were right next to each other. So Sort of as if Stacy was displaying her trophies in a really sick way. So that is when they decide to exhume Michael's body and do an autopsy because they also found out that Stacy had never done an autopsy. So I didn't know they could do this, but to exhume a body, basically they dig up a dead body and sometimes this is used to perform an autopsy that was never performed or possibly to uh, dig the plot up and cremate the body or to dig the plot up and move it elsewhere but they exhumed the body to try to get an autopsy and when they did an autopsy on Michael Wallace's body they found antifreeze crystals in his system. They also looked into Michael's medical records to see if maybe Michael had tried to do this before but there was no record of Michael having any sort of antifreeze in his body. As I said, Stacy refused an autopsy and also found in his body was rat poison as if this person, whoever the killer was, found out that the antifreeze was taking way too long so they gave Michael rat poison in order to speed up the process. They also found Stacy's old statements and found that Stacy, when she was giving her statement about Michael, she constantly said how Michael had all of these underlying medical conditions, but when they looked at Michael's medical records, they found no medical conditions. The only thing they found was a hernia, but he had no underlying medical conditions. With all of this suspicious things on Stacy, the police decide to do a second interrogation, and so they bring Stacy in for a second questioning. So immediately right off the bat, they catch Stacy in her very first lie. And that was because, as I said earlier, the police had looked into her phone records and found that she had only called the house once, even though in her statement, she stressed that she had called multiple times before calling the police. So when they went to Stacy and was like, hey, we checked your phone records and turns out you only called once, but you told us that you called multiple times. She tried 
try to cover this up and say, oh, well, I didn't call it from my home phone. I called it from my business phone. And they said that we also checked your business phone records and you still only called one time that morning. And so that was the very first lie that she was caught in. There was also one point in the interrogation where they show her a picture of the two cups and only one of the cups had three fingerprints on it. And she was told to um, point at which cup had her fingerprints on it. And she actually said, quote, when she was pointing at the cup, she said, yes, this cup right here, this is the cup I poured antifree, I mean cranberry juice in. So literally, literally she just said it. She just said that she had poured antifreeze into this cup. She had just said it. So at this point, Stacy starts panicking because she finds out or she's starting to really feel and realize that the police are on to her. And so in a panic, she doesn't know what to do. So that is when on September 14th of 2007, Ashley had came home from school and it was on the same day that Michael's body was being exhumed and she was just feeling really sad that day she just didn't want you know her father's body to be dug up she just wanted him to rest in peace and so that is when Stacy offers for Ashley to drink and so Ashley being only 19 years old at the time she was like oh my god yes I would love a drink and so Stacy and Ashley drink a little bit and then the next day Ashley wakes up a little bit hungover but she's still fine enough to go to her morning classes because she was at college at the time so she woke up she went to her morning classes and then when she came home from school at 12 p.m. that is when Stacy offers again if Ashley would like to have another drink and Ashley says okay because you know she had some fun drinking with her mom the day before but she said that this time around the drink just tasted really odd. It tasted very sour and so her mom said that the reason why it tasted really sour is because she had put more vodka in it and so Stacy gives Ashley a straw and she's like, here, if you drink it through the straw and you just let the vodka go straight down your throat, then it won't even hit your taste buds and you won't have to taste it. So that's exactly what Ashley does. She drinks this drink through a straw and then at 1.30 p.m. she goes back in her room to take a nap. Now, the following day, a whole day goes by and Brie realizes that she hasn't seen Ashley come out of her room since 1.30 in the afternoon the day before and she was kind of growing a little concern as to why like she hadn't came out of her room. So that is when Brie goes into Ashley's room because her door was unlocked and she sees Ashley on her bed and she sees Ashley on the bed with her eyes and mouth open and she was unresponsive. So when she sees Ashley in this state, Brie screams and this uh, calls the attention of Stacy. Stacy runs upstairs. She's wondering what's going on. And immediately when she sees Ashley, she calls the police and tells the police what's going on. But what's really odd is that when Stacy called the police to tell like the police about Ashley and to bring an ambulance over, she had told the police that Ashley had taken pills. And that is the reason why she was like that, which was very odd because there was nothing around Ashley or nothing with Ashley at all that indicated she was taking pills. And then while Stacy was on the phone with the police, Ashley had thrown up onto the floor. And immediately when Ashley threw up on the floor, Stacy weirdly changed her story on the phone with the police. And she just said, oh, wait, Ashley, she didn't take pills. She actually took Ambien and chugged a whole bottle of vodka. And that is why she's like this. Which again is like really odd because it's like, why would you, why would you even say that? That's such like a weirdly specific detail that she just made up on the spot. And so Brie says that in this moment after seeing Ashley throw up, she just felt super overwhelmed. So she goes out into the hallway to kind of catch herself. And then when she goes back in the room, she sees this note that just magically appeared on the nightstand. And she didn't notice this note before. So she goes to grab it. And as she's reading it, uh, St- Stacy grabs the note out of her hand and she tells the police that are on the 
phone. She's like, oh my God, Brie just found a note from Ashley. I think it's a suicide note. And it's talking about how Ashley actually killed her father, Michael, and her stepfather, David. And now she's trying to kill herself. And like, she said all of this and it's a long note. And she just said all of this to the police as if she had read it before. And so the paramedics show up, they take Ashley to the hospital and after a lot of trying they were able to actually save Ashley and when Ashley woke up she had no recollection of what happened. She actually asked the doctors if she had gone into a car accident because she had no clue what was going on. And when the doctors told Ashley, well, you had typed a suicide note saying that you killed your father and stepfather and now you were trying to kill yourself, she, the doctors and police that were there at the time said that Ashley looked super scared and confused and she didn't have a a look of like oh I got caught or like a look of guilt she just looked genuinely terrified and trying to like piece together what was going on so the police asked her what was the last thing that she remembered and then that's when she told the police about the weird drink that her mom had gave her and then all of a sudden afterwards she felt tired so she went to sleep and now she's waking up in a hospital and that's all she really remembers and so going a little bit further on the suicide note as I said Ashley at this time was a college student writing college essays but this note it sounded like an adult writing a note as if they were a kid if that makes sense in the note it was constantly using words like mommy and daddy and please forgive me and um I didn't mean to do this and I don't want you to be mad at me she it was just it felt like an adult trying to talk like a kid which was very odd because as I said Ashley is a college student so there is no reason for her to just be talking like this and so they found that to be very very odd and there was also a lot of misspellings of very common words which again was very odd because Ashley was a college student and if this was a premeditated suicide you know typing out a suicide note she would at least know or proofread it um, by like, you know, making sure she spelt everything right, not using words like mommy and daddy. And then at 4 p.m. that same day, that is when Stacy was arrested for the murder of David Castor and the attempted murder of Ashley Wallace. And the entire time, uh, Stacy had preached innocence and basically just blamed everything on Ashley. And she said that Ashley had to be the person that did this because in the note, it also mentioned rat poison, which was a really big tell that whoever the author of this note was, was the killer because it was not made public knowledge, not even to the family yet at this point, that they had found rat poison in Michael's body. This was something that only the police knew. So they knew whoever wrote this note had killed Michael. And at the time Michael had died, Ashley was only 12 years old. So Stacy was basically blaming all of this onto 12 year old Ashley saying that Ashley had killed Michael because she knew that Michael had favorited Brie over her and that was her motive for killing Michael and throughout her entire trial Stacy it was basically Stacy versus Ashley trying to figure out who wrote the suicide note and who was to blame for all of this Everybody was pointing at Stacy because Stacy, there's just no way for a 12 year old to not only know that antifreeze kills you, but also to know that rat poison speeds up the process. And of course, the the logistics of a 12 year old trying to attain of trying to obtain rat poison and antifreeze that's not something a 12 year old can just get and they lived in like a really nice neighborhood and stuff so this wasn't you know it's not like they lived in a bad neighborhood where she was able to get anything and also at the trial it was shown that Ashley had no mental illnesses when she was younger there was no outbursts at school that suggested that she had these murderous tendencies Stacy was just basically taking the suicide note for a fact 
and basically pointing everything like, look, Ashley wrote this and this and that, when all in all, like everybody knew that Stacy had written the note. They even found on Stacy's home computer, they found two drafts of the suicide note and they found that the third one was printed at 7 p.m. the night before uh, Brie had found Ashley lying in her bed. And so again, there would be no way for Ashley to print out this note if she was lying unconscious in her bed. They also know how in Stacy's original statement when David had passed away, she and her eight-page document basically kept on honing in on the fact that David was depressed, he was suicidal, he didn't know like where he was going in life, he drank a lot. She was just pointing, she was basically just giving the police all of these bullet points to make it sound like it was a suicide, but now Stacy is completely switching her story and she's like, actually, David didn't mean it like that and the reason why he didn't mean it like that is because Ashley had killed him and so this really called into question the validity of her very first statement was she lying in the first place to cover up her tracks but now that she sees that there's another opportunity for her to walk away free she's taking this one without even thinking about the past statements she's made so Stacy, the more she talks the more she's just making herself look more and more guilty and so at the trial they actually brought out the suicide note and they found a lot of really odd things in it they said that the note seemed purposely dumbed down there were no periods in the entire note not a single punctuation in the entire note it sounded like it was written by a four-year-old and they also um and Ashley and Brie actually made a statement to their mother Stacy saying that that it was very disrespectful for Stacy to write this note as if it was making Ashley seem dumb when she has worked hard all of her life to get into college and try to make something of herself and this is how her mother views her. She saw it as very disrespectful and the entire time when Ashley and Brie are crying on the stand and like saying all these things to Stacy, Stacy just seems so emotionless. She doesn't have any reaction to any of this. She's just staring at them as if they are a bother to her. So then that is when in January of 2009, she was given 25 years to life for the murder of David, another 25 years for the attempted murder of Ashley, and an additional few years for forging a will because during the trial, she did not confess to the two, uh, she did not confess to the murder of David, and she did not confess to the attempted murder of Ashley, but she did confess to forging David's signature on the will. Now, again, why would you even forge a signature on a will if you didn't plan on that person dying soon? Like, David was young. He was, uh, David was still young. He had a lot of life left in him. Like, he had a whole business that he, that he ran. So, that it just made no sense that Ashley would forge his signature if she didn't know that she was going to get this reward soon. So with all of those charges combined, she was sentenced to 51 years in prison. For some reason, they didn't give her life even though she had murdered someone um, in such a violent and brutal way. She was only given 51 years and she was eligible for release by her 88th birthday, but she would never make it to her 88th birthday because on June 11th of 2016, Stacy was found dead in her cell and the paramedics deemed it as a heart attack. So Stacy had passed away and that is kind of where this story wraps up. As far as the family now, David was removed from his plot next to Michael. He was moved to a different plot. This was actually an action done by David Jr. David Jr. just felt like it was really disrespectful to keep the two so close. So David Jr. had moved his plot next to a plot that he had for himself when he passes away. 
birthday so he could be buried next to his father. As far as Brie and Ashley, they have spoken to the media a lot in the like past years, uh, just basically talking about their story and how they feel about everything. And as far as like recently, they haven't really been in the public eye and I just hope that they are healing from all of this because those two girls, they really do only have each other. Like their both of their fathers are gone, their mother is gone. They truly just have each other. So I really hope that they are coping as much as they can and they are healing from all of this. And also another story that I found when researching this was there was actually a conspiracy going around that Stacy had poisoned her father and um, and that's how her father had passed away. There was this conspiracy that her father Father, Stacy's father was in the hospital and this was actually like mind-boggling to me. So Stacy, her father was in the hospital and whilst her father was in the hospital, he was actually making a quite like quick recovery and he was, you know, really starting to get better until one day Stacy's family members said that they saw Stacy walk into her father's hospital room with an open can of Coca-Cola and a straw and basically gave it to him and then the very next day his condition had worsened a lot and he ended up dying that same exact day and the part that really got me is that Stacy's dad was buried right next to Michael and David again just like as if Stacy was displaying her trophies as if she was like proud of all of these people that she had killed and that part really mind boggled me because there are photos to prove that all three of them were buried right next to each other so that was one conspiracy that I found um but yeah that's where the family is now and that is the end of today's story um if you guys found this interesting, make sure to give it a rating on Spotify or wherever you can find podcasts and make sure to give it a thumbs up on my YouTube channel, Haley Elizabeth. And yeah, that was the very first episode of Behind You. I hope that you guys enjoyed. Um, there were, sorry if there was like a lot of hiccups or something throughout all of this. It's the first episode. We're just going to learn as we go along. This was a, you know, this was, this was interesting to do. I really enjoyed doing this podcast. And so I hope that you guys found this interesting. And if you want to see more, I will be back here on Wednesday to watch the visual version on my YouTube channel, Haley Elizabeth, or you can find the audio version every Tuesday, wherever you can find podcasts. So that's all from me and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. I love you, I love you and yeah, <laughs> goodbye.